So just before the break, we were looking at what exactly is meant by being created in the image of God. And just to continue that line of thought uh, for just a little while longer, uh, this 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 um, thing which I read in an article. Now I'm not saying that this is doctrine and that we it's actually. Um, doctrinal and in line with the Bible, but it's just an interesting way of looking at this whole idea of image of God. Uh, this person uh, refers to Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22, where you basically have some Pharisees and Herodians who kind of want to trap Jesus and get him get him into trouble with the Roman authorities, uh, you know, because in that time they had a lot of debate about um, whether Jewish people should be paying taxes to a pagan heathen emperor. Shouldn't they actually be giving their money to the temple because after all they are God's people? So there was a lot of debate going on back then about whether Jewish people should actually give their taxes to a uh, to a, a Roman emperor who doesn't even believe in God or trust in Yahweh. So they thought they can get Jesus into trouble by bringing up this issue. And so they ask and they say, uh, you know, Lord, should we be giving taxes to Caesar or not? So they are hoping that whatever he answers, uh, that will, you know, get him into trouble with the Roman authorities. That, that was their hope. But then, of course, you know, right, Jesus turns the tables and then he says, you know, you um, bring me a coin and then they bring the coin. And whose image do you have on the coin? You have the image of Caesar. So then God says, uh, this is the, this is the verse. Um, maybe if we could read out Matthew chapter 22, uh, verses 20, 21. Yeah, that should be mm. Yeah, um, in uh, this brother's translation, it says, Render to God what is God's and render to Caesar uh, what is Caesar's, what belongs to him. So um, in the NIV, it says, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. So the coin had the image of Caesar, which clearly sh you know, showed everyone that because that coin bears his image, it belongs to him. He is the owner of that you know, coin in the sense he's the one who has issued those particular coins. So they say in the same way, God wanted to um, impart his image to us, you know, to show that we belong to him, that he is our owner. Now, that's just a nice way of seeing it. I'm not saying that this uh, doctrinal uh, basis for that, but it's just a nice way of seeing it that, you know, because I bear his image, it shows that I belong to him. Just a very nice thought. Um, okay, uh, let's not base our doctrine on that. Um, now, coming to this whole idea of human consciousness, um, if you look at a plant, the plant is just, you know, existing out there, but it's not aware that it exists. It doesn't think, oh, okay, I exist. I have been made. Someone planted me here. It has no thoughts. It has no, it has no consciousness. It has no awareness. It just exists. On the other hand, when it comes to animals, they do have a certain level of awareness, a certain consciousness. Uh, they think, uh, they're able to relate. So you have all of that. And then when it comes to humans, there's a huge spike. I mean, the level of awareness and consciousness is like amazing. A great wide uh, divide between animals and humans. And so, which is why, you know, uh, Christians say, because we are created in the image of God, in the sense that we have the spirit of God, the same way he is a spirit, we are a spirit. And like him, we can think like him. Uh, we understand things like him. We can, you know, uh, reflect and try to 
uh, grasp where we are from, why uh, why we are over here, what our purpose is while we are over here, all of that. So people, you know, believers, we say that because we have been created in his image and we have a spirit like him, therefore we have a consciousness, we have a high level of awareness. But people who do not believe in God, they say, no, no, no. The reason that we have this consciousness is because that's the way the chemicals in the brain work. The chemicals in the brain are working in a particular way. The chemical processes are going on. And just because of that, we, we think. Because of those chemical processes in the brain, we feel. Because of those chemical processes in the, in the brain, we react in a particular way. But you cannot reduce human consciousness, human awareness to a bunch of chemical processes. For instance, you know, take a monkey. The monkey has chemical processes running in its brain because of which when there's danger, it can sense the danger. It starts running away. Um, because there are chemical processes running in its brain, it, re it relates to other monkeys. It's able to you know, live in a community uh, setting. Um, because there are chemical processes in the brain functioning, uh, the monkey is able to even create some basic tools. It can take one rock and use it like a tool to break another rock. These are all basic chemical processes which are enable it to function in a particular way. But no monkey ever sits down and asks itself, who am I? Why am I here? Who created me? The monkey doesn't do that. On the other hand, humans have this deep level of consciousness, awareness, where they ask complex questions and where they even think about eternal things, things which are not of this physical realm. Even those who say they don't believe in God, you know, they go after witchcraft and they talk about spirituality and even they are trying to reach out to things which are beyond this natural realm, which clearly shows that there's something more to a human being than just a bunch of chemical processes in the, in the brain. This is, we are spirit beings, and so we automatically reach out to the spiritual realm. Whether we reach out to God or whether we reach out to the evil forces, because we are created as spirit beings, we, we can't help it. We automatically begin to reach out to something beyond just this natural realm. So we are, we, we, uh, whether the, you know, those who don't believe in God, whether they admit it or not, they also are reaching out to something beyond just the physical, natural things. Because of, and that is why we say human consciousness, awareness is a result of the fact that we are spirit beings. Okay, so we are not just a bunch of chemical processes that have evolved. And um, uh, it's First Thessalonians 5, verse 23, which kind of brings out this uh, clear, uh, you know, um, clarification that we are basically three different components. Uh, so we we you know we speak of the human being spirit soul and body basically because of this particular verse. So if someone could read out First Thessalonians chapter five verse twenty three. Okay, so based on this verse, we say that we humans have been, we are spirit beings, but we also have a soul. And that soul is basically our thoughts, our um, willpower, you know, what we decide to do, our thoughts, our will, and all our feelings, all our emotions, and all our choices which we make. All of these things are basically what we, we use the word soul to talk about this. When we're talking about feelings and our will and our uh, you know, uh, our decisions and our emotions, basically we use the word soul for all of that. So we are spirit beings, but we have a soul which, you know, thinks and feels and, and uh, you know, um, reasons out and makes choices and all of that. So we are spirit beings who have a soul. And of course, we live in this human container, this human container, which we call the human body. We all live inside uh, that. So um, it's nice to just kind of see what the Bible has to say regarding these three aspects of the human being. So we'll begin by looking at uh, what the Bible has to say regarding the spirit. Um, 
so because we are spirit beings even though this physical container will one day perish and die we will continue to exist because the spirit is eternal the same way god's spirit is eternal he made us in his image and we also are eternal beings so even if a person goes to hell he doesn't stop to exist he continues to exist forever and ever only thing the terrible thing is that he's now he's living forever and ever in hell um so that would be a very terrible thing so the spirit is an eternal thing and it can never die it can never stop existing and uh, uh, also because we are spirit beings we are able to reach out to god we are able to communicate with him we are able to understand things in the spiritual realm it's because we are spirit beings uh, maybe two verses that we can look at regarding you know ourselves as spirit beings the first would be romans chapter 6 verse 6 if someone could read out all right uh, so over here in romans 6:6 six, six, it's saying something about the uh, uh, spirit okay it says our old self was crucified with him so over here that old self which is being talked about that is basically the old fallen spiritually dead spirit okay so that was crucified with christ and then if uh, we could read out the next verse second corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 so it is and over here the new creation which is being talked about this is the new spirit okay, so this is one um, basic thing that we all need to grasp that when adam and eve sinned they did die the way god said they would because they are spirit beings they died in their spirit the physical container continued but in their spirits they were no longer uh, alive they became spiritually dead on the inside so uh, there was a spiritual death when adam and eve sinned so that same spiritual deadness was passed on generation after generation so all people they would be uh, they would come into this world being spiritually dead not connected to the vine you know like we you know using our new testament wording uh, they are not connected to the vine they are disconnected from the vine so they are spiritually dead and when they have an encounter with yahweh you know in old testament times and they would follow those mosaic procedures and you know submit to him and obey him and place their faith in him uh, based on the faith which they are placing in him uh, through those rituals god would uh, you know um, consider them as his own so uh, but the actual uh, becoming a new creation that only happened after you know jesus christ came so so what happens is at the moment of salvation jesus christ takes this old spiritually dead spirit, uh, spirit which is inside us he takes it and he crucifies it on the cross so symbolically because of what christ jesus did on the cross this old sinful nature is also crucified for everyone who chooses to place their trust in him so what happens once this physically once this old spiritually dead spirit is crucified what is inside the human container now is it completely empty once christ jesus crucifies your old sinful spirit what happens inside that thing dies it's gone it's it's over it's no longer there so what's inside your human container now is it just empty inside no in that very very moment the holy spirit births a new spirit a new creation in that very moment in the in the in the you know in the in, in something lesser than a microsecond this spiritual process happens the old sinfully dead spirit is crucified gotten rid of and in its place god births a new spirit and you become that new spirit so you are a new creation in your thinking of course you still have the unrenewed mind 
your physical container is still exactly the same physical container but you the spirit being have now been made alive in christ you are a new spirit so that's what happens in the moment of salvation okay so um, now for the old testament people uh, they could not have that uh, you know because the holy spirit had not yet been released to indwell inside them but they were kept covered until the time when jesus christ would perform his act and then they would be able to enter into heaven as you know um, um, fully in the way they are meant to you know as um, as spirit beings who have you know been renewed so uh, we don't really know exactly what and all was involved in that but we do know that once jesus christ did what he did on the cross even the old testament people who had placed their faith in him moses and abraham and david and all of them at that moment whatever was done for us was also done for them uh, okay so because it says in hebrews i think uh, so the promise which had been made to them it was not given to them at that time it was fulfilled you know in our time once jesus christ had done what he did is what it says in uh, you know in hebrews if i remember so there are different terms used in the bible for this word spirit like we saw just now in romans 6 6 you know it's it's being uh, the old dead spirit is being called old self so that's one term which is used for the human spirit there are many other terms which are used for the to describe the human spirit maybe we can look at uh, psalm 73 verse 1 if someone could read out psalm 73 verse 1 God certainly is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Here it says, uh, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And here the word heart, you know, that Old Testament word lev, that basically is talking about spirit. In some places where, where you have the word lev being used, it's just talking about the human heart which pumps. And in some places where the word uh, lev is used, it's talking about emotions. But over here, in this particular verse, Psalm 73, 1, that word lev, which means heart, is basically being used to talk about the spirit, those who are pure in spirit. In the same way, John 7, 38, um, if someone could read out, yeah. No. Water will flow from within them. I, yeah, wait. I'm a little distracted. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm uh, you know, so sorry if you could just read out again. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Will flow from within him. Um, you know. KJV, the old ancient KJV, actually uh, brings out the uh, literal translation where it says, out of his belly you know, shall flow rivers of living water. So the, uh, the, you know, the Greek word used over this, literally belly, out of the belly will, uh, you know, out of the stomach will flow rivers of uh, living water. So over there, that word belly is, is being used to talk about the spirit. Uh, in, our, in, in our modern translations, you'll, uh, maybe you'll say inner, uh, the inner person or your inward being. Rivers will flow out of your inward being. So you have different terms used, but actually in the in the Greek, literally that word belly, the word stomach is used out of that. Uh, it's belly is not just your stomach; it's the, the lower part of you, where you, where, it, where the something like the de like the depths of your um, of your stomach. Yeah, it just sounds very strange. Okay. Um, I mean, that was the way they, their language was used. Second uh, Corinthians uh, four sixteen. If someone could read out, outwardly we are wasting away; at inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Okay, so uh, inwardly again, it's just being saying inwardly. Uh, you know, in NKJV, it will say, yet the in, inner man, the inward man is being renewed. So these are all different terms that are being used to talk about the human spirit. Okay, so we just saw some examples. Um, 
now there's the question over here from Nina. Only thing I'm not, um, I didn't quite grasp the question uh, because it says in what way, you know, this whole idea of conscience is connected to our concept of an indwelling spirit. I am not particularly sure, I mean, uh, you know, what you're, you're aiming at. But just simply randomly answering conscience is more to do with our um, uh, sense of right and wrong and all of that, right? So, as a spirit being, we have a sense of right and wrong. So, we have a conscience. Um, because he has put those moral absolutes inside our spirit, we kind of instinctively have this feeling when we do something wrong. Uh, we know that we have done wrong. So even a person who doesn't know the Bible, you know, if they do something hurtful, they have that sense of guilt inside their conscience. So a conscience is basically that part of you which is able to kind of grasp um, the moral aspects of what God wants. So how does the conscience figure in a Christian with the indwelling spirit in him. So a human conscience can be... A human conscience basically reflects the moral absolutes which God has placed inside. So everyone knows that it is wrong to lie and uh, so they do feel that sense that what they're doing is something wrong and so they better cover it. They better do it cleverly. When you want to lie, you try to lie in a clever way because you don't want others to catch the wrong which you are doing. You know it's a wrong thing. It, it's something that should be covered. It's something that should be hidden. So automatically you are acknowledging that what you are doing is wrong and so you try to cover your lie and you know, so that others don't catch you doing this wrong thing. So everyone senses in their heart that lies is wrong. But I can grow to a stage where I, I'm, or not grow, I can fall to a stage where I deaden my conscience to such an extent where I will lie happily without even, um, without even feeling anything. That is possible. So my human conscience can be deadened and toughened and thickened. Ah, uh, my, I know one person. If she would just open her mouth, only lies would come out. It had just become a habit. She was not a bad person because. Very, very helpful nature, nice um, in so many ways, even loved God. But oh my goodness, I mean, she's no more. Uh, but I mean, uh, you know, she she would lie just for the sake of lying. I mean, you, you, I think even she knows that everyone knows that she's lying. But then, okay, yeah. So I'm just saying you, you can actually go to a stage where you can just lie without even feeling it. So the human conscience can be deadened. But if you have the indwelling spirit living in you, he will start trying to bring that conscience back to life. So uh, if you start um, allowing yourself to be led by the Holy Spirit, your conscience will start getting sensitive once again under his guidance, under his leading. So you will no longer be deadened. So which is why a believer who's really walking with the Lord will have a more and more sensitive conscience. He will be more and more aware of the Holy Spirit's leading. And he will sense when, when, when something that he has said is not really pleasing to the Lord, he'll immediately sense it. On the other hand, a person whose conscience is still quite deadened and who's not yet completely in line with the Holy Spirit will probably not catch it. They may in fact say something very rude and not even feel anything about it. So. Um, so, yeah, so to an extent, the conscience is kind of operating along with the Holy Spirit. But we can deaden our conscience if we wish to. But the more we align ourselves with the Holy Spirit, the more our conscience will become sensitive. And we will be able to clearly hear God's leading about the whether the things that we are doing is right or wrong. A person can maybe listen to, an, uh, to a song and feel nothing. On the other hand, a person who's more in tune with the Holy Spirit may, may listen to the same song and immediately think, 
my goodness that's of the world it's just that you know that you your your conscience is becoming more sensitive the more sensitive you are to the holy spirit the more alive uh, and in line with the lord the conscience would be i get, i hope that helps to some extent okay yeah um all right uh, we were looking at the different terms used in the bible for the human spirit um and yeah we we know that uh, once the spirit leaves the human container all you have is that dead container the container is just you know useless it has served its purpose it's no longer needed but the spirit person continues to exist forever and ever they can never stop existing and um, we have that in james chapter 2 verse 26 so if someone could read out james 2 26 for just as the body without the spirit is dead so also faith without works is dead so as long as the spirit is inhabiting the container the container stays alive but the minute the spirit being leaves the container the container dies it it no longer has any purpose so it just perishes okay so that's a um biblically established fact um and we also know that this spirit being will one day get reattached to the human container and in that moment that human container will get transformed into something else which we call the resurrected body and this is an experience which even unbelievers will undergo let's um look at first corinthians chapter 15 verse 52 it talks about how the dead will be raised with bodies that won't decay so whether the person is a believer or an unbeliever you know i had actually written down that verse yesterday the one which talks about you know the resurrection of even the unbelievers and i wiped it out now i off the top of my head i can't seem to remember the reference um so whether you're a believer or an unbeliever when you died your spirit being left the human container and different things happened to the human container you know you you were either cremated or you were buried if you're in a if you're in a aeroplane explosion you you your human container got broken into tiny tiny little, little, little bits but the point is when that resurrection time happens all those little little bits will come back and reattach together and your spirit being will actually go into that container once again but that container is no longer the way it is now it will become something which cannot decay so if a person ends up in hell even though you have hell fire burning over there they would continue to burn over there but that bo that, that body in which they are now living will never decay they would experience the pain of hell always but um, that body would never perish or something like that these are all just things that we you know uh, we are trying to grasp and understand uh, they have not yet occurred so we don't fully comprehend it but one thing we do know that the spirit being will one day come back into the human container and this human container will not stay the same there will be something called a resurrection body so the those who have uh, not believed in the lord they will uh, be resurrected and move on to punishment and judgment and hell and those who have believed in the lord they too will be resurrected they too will come back into the resurrected body and then they will move uh, towards eternity and uh, you know god's presence and enjoy that so yeah okay coming to the soul which is a easier thing to discuss Uh, so the soul of course you know we already looked at that we uh, we 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 said that it is the mind it is the will it is the emotions so because of the soul we can think we can feel and all of that uh, now the soul can be um unrenewed 
you know it it has not been transformed by the holy spirit uh, or it can be a renewed soul what do i mean by that uh, after salvation you know we are now a new creation right our spirit is now a new spirit which has been birthed by the holy spirit so we choose to train our mind uh, we true we choose to train our emotions you know so the more we train our mind and our emotions and bring them in line with the word of god the more and more renewed they become but a person who never bothers to train up their uh, mind you know train up their feelings and emotions they'll continue to be what they were so you have you can have a fleshly soul or you can have a godly soul which is growing and getting renewed in the things of god so in that sense uh, so it is our duty to teach our mind new things for instance if you are very very um, angry with someone someone has hurt you and so you have feelings of hatred and anger and you also have thoughts in your mind about how nice it will be if a bomb comes and you know drops on them and they you know explode so you have you have wrong thoughts you also have wrong feelings so what do you do if you are a sincere believer you try to bring your thoughts and your emotions in line with scripture so you tell your mind yeah yeah these thoughts that you're thinking about a bomb dropping on the person no that's not the way god thinks god scripture says that you are called to forgive and scripture says that because you are a new creation a new spirit you have the ability to forgive your old dead, dead spirit didn't have any control over itself it it just could not do anything but sin but you you are now a new creation so mind you don't have to think about bombs and all of that you are able capable of forgiving god will help you so remove those negative thoughts from your mind and instead say to the lord lord bless this person in spite of what they have done and in your time grant me justice do for me you know because you are a god of justice do for me what is right but lord have mercy upon this person and bless them and also help them to know that the wrong they have done so that they'll not do that to someone else so you 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 train your mind to start thinking in a correct manner you choose to renew your thinking in the same way those emotions of anger and hatred you say no i'm not going to continue entertaining these emotions instead i will choose to you know ask the lord uh, to bless this person so you cut those emotions and say no i'm not going to go on indulging myself in these feelings i choose to stop feeling this and rather focus my mind on what god says about this person and even as you do that your emotions will slowly come under control okay so um all of these things you choose to do uh, for your soul and renew it but if you don't do any of that your soul will be very carnal very fleshly and it will be very very difficult to live a godly spiritual uh, life so it is so important that we should start training our mind and our emotions um now it's not really possible to divide the spirit and the soul into separate watertight compartments because we are a spirit being and we have a soul with all these feelings and emotions and will and all of that so that is why in many places in the bible when when it talks about soul or spirit it's basically talking about both of them together as one combined unit let's actually look at some examples which will make it easier to understand genesis chapter 2 verse 7 you know which we have read before uh, but if you you know the last portion where it says you know that god breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul okay so the, the that's the actual word used over there the word nefesh that's the hebrew word for soul so over here it's not saying that man became only a soul and not a spirit it's talking about both soul and spirit that word soul which is used over there in genesis 2:7 that word nefesh it's it's talking about combination of both soul and spirit let's look at a new testament example matthew 16 verse 26 if someone can read out matthew 16:26 
So over here, it's not talking about just your soul. It's talking about combination of soul and spirit. Okay, so uh, it's being used in that sense. Um, coming to the body, the human body. Uh, the human body obviously is the physical part of us. Uh, the human body has got five senses, um, you know, taste and smell and touch and can't remember the other two, but we have all the five. And we use these five of them to gather information, gather input from the physical world around us. So um, um, we are able to see things in front of us. And then we decide whether those things are good or bad based upon what scripture has to say. So we, we gather information and we use our soul, our mind and, and our spirit to determine whether what we are seeing is good or bad. Um, in the same way, hearing. You know, we, can he we hear all the things around us. And then whatever we are hearing if through our physical ears, we, we send that information to our spirit and our soul, and our spirit and our soul decides, oh, should I continue hearing this? Is it a good thing to listen to, or do I stop? OK, so the physical body collects the information, but it's the soul and the spirit which decide what to do with that information. Are you going to respond to that information in a godly manner, or are you going to respond to it in a sinful manner, in a rebellious manner? The choice would be ours. Um, now, uh, there's one thing that maybe we can just touch upon because, you know, um, Paul, Paul, when he uses the word flesh, he uses it in a whole bunch of different ways. So it's just kind of helpful for us to know what he is talking about. And that uh, Greek word which he actually uses is something called SARS, S-A-R-X. Okay, so if you look at the Pauline epistles, it's filled with this word SARS. He keeps using the word SARS all over the place. And he has generally four different meanings when he is using that word SARS. So it kind of, it's kind of helpful for us to know uh, in what ways he is using that particular word flesh. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 39, if someone can read out. 1 Corinthians 15, 39. So what kind of uh, flesh is he talking about over here? He's just talking about literally that, you know, that flesh, which is covering your bones, which is inside your skin. It's just talking about that. So the SARS over here, when, when the word SARS is being used, it's just talking about your actual flesh. Okay. The second way that he uses the word, uh, an example would be 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. So over here, he's talking about things which can contaminate your human body and things which can contaminate your spirit. So over here, that word SARS, that word flesh is being used for uh, not not just this, you know, this muscles and all which are inside, not that flesh. It's talking about the entire human body, the actual physical body. So sins which can contaminate your physical body. And then there are some sins which will contaminate your spirit, you know, your attitudes, pride, jealousy, and all of that. Those are, uh, those will contaminate your spirit. But then there are physical sins, sexual immorality, uh, you know, in, in, in indulging in murder. So those, those would be physical contaminants. Uh, so, um, so here, the second way that Paul uses the word SARS, it is for the basic human body. The third way that he uses the word, an example that we can look at would be Galatians chapter 1, verse 16. He says that he did not consult any flesh and blood when he was first told about the gospel. Okay, so basically he's saying over here, uh, it was that Jesus Christ himself who taught him the gospel. 
he was not one of the 12 disciples right so he didn't go around for, uh, with jesus from uh, town to town learning from him he came later so he says even though i came later jesus christ personally came to me and he himself taught me the gospel i did not learn it from flesh and blood over here he's talking about human beings so the third way that Paul uses this word SARS is, is not talking about just the physical human body, he's just talking about human beings. I did not learn the gospel from human beings. Christ himself came and taught it to me, is what he is saying. The fourth way, the, the most common way in which Paul uses the word SARS will be the last one, Galatians 5.16. Someone can read out Galatians 5.16. Yeah, so over here, that word SARS, that word flesh is being used for the evil desires of the body and the soul. So um, so in these four different ways, the word SARS is used and uh, it helps to look at a commentary to figure out in what sense he is using it in different places. Because based on the context of that entire Bible passage, you will be able to assess in what way he is using that particular term. Um, all right, just moving on very quickly to the concept of free will in humans. Um, some people say that humans don't really have 100% free will because if humans had 100% free will, then what about God's sovereignty? People can do whatever they want. If, we, if we, people can do whatever they want, then God cannot be sovereign. So they act like as if free will and God's sovereignty are two opposites which cannot uh, function together. But we believe, based on scripture, that human beings have been given 100% free will. Even after salvation, a person who has, you know, what is the wording over there in Hebrew 6? A person who has um, um, tasted of the heavenly gift, a person who has shared in the Holy Spirit, even such a person still has 100% free will and if they choose to walk away they are they are able to so the free will given to human beings is 100% we have complete choice god is not controlling us forcefully in any way he will persuade us he will you know anoint us if he asks me say lord please anoint me because i cannot come out of the sin on my own you anoint me you give me the power to come out of this he will enable us but it's always with us asking for it. It's always with us reaching out to him. He will never forcefully do it. Okay, so, um, so in, in spite of all the decisions which human beings take, in spite of all the rebellious things that they do, ultimately he has the power and the wisdom to accomplish his purposes in spite of all the choices which we make. So human beings have 100% have free will to make all the wrong choices that they want to if they wish to. But it doesn't affect his sovereignty because ultimately he has enough brains, he's wise enough to know how to uh, accomplish his purposes in spite of all the wrong choices which we made. Okay, so human beings, as you know, as, as a group, as humanity, they have chosen to rebel against God, they have chosen to go against his plans and purposes, they have chosen to you know live in evil ways which oppress the people and hurt people. They have done all of these things, but ultimately, God has the wisdom and the power to accomplish his purposes in his perfect timing. So when the time comes. He will do whatever he wants to do. He will even use these wrong things which people have done and he will manipulate and turn them around to be able to accomplish what he finally wants to achieve for humanity. So God's sovereignty is never affected. His sovereignty is in place. He knows what he's doing. He, In fact, he laid out the plan before the foundation of the world itself. He came up with the plan of what he's going to you know, do with uh, the decisions which people are going to take. So everything was already decided. And now God is just you know, working it out step by step. So his sovereignty is not affected in any way. And human beings, uh, they have been given the freedom to do whatever they wish to do. But whatever they do will ultimately not affect his eternal plans. He is completely sovereign. So um, those are the two sides of you know um, free will that we need to understand. Um, the... 
because adam sinned against god that free will has now become corrupted so we are not able to um adam before the fall he automatically had this desire to please god in everything but then after the fall his free will got corrupted and therefore now you know human beings make a lot of wrong choices which uh, which displease god so we are autonomous uh, you know in our free will we have the power to use it the way we want uh, but we have to understand that this free will which we now have is a corrupted thing without god's help without his anointing uh, we will not be able to do it on our own so we are meant to go to him we are supposed to depend upon him we are supposed to ask him for his help and his power and he will help us to use our free will in the right way because of what adam did our free will has now become corrupted it's no longer the way it was before so we have to now go to him consciously and say lord i want to abide in the vine i want to stay attached to you so you help me oh lord to use my free will in the right way and he will enable us to uh, do that um okay we have 4 minutes time is always such a factor um just why you know why are we here we haven't quite touched upon that question what is the purpose of us being over here uh, let's go directly to the verse which is the verse there's so many verses okay isaiah 437 if someone can read out isaiah 437 Okay, so over here it's talking about the people who are called by His name, and He says, "Why did He create them? He created them for His glory." Now there are other verses which talk about how all of humanity, all of creation, has one purpose: created for His glory. so that's the ultimate thing there's no time now to go through all of the verses so i know i'm just giving you the final conclusion why was humanity created so that we can glorify god so if someone asks you what is your main purpose in life your main purpose in life is to glorify god but you know in psalm 139 13 to 16 it talks about how god you know saw us while we were still being formed inside the womb and while we were still inside the inside our mother's womb it says he ordained all the days of our life and he wrote them down in his book so god has decided uh, how in what manner each of us is going to glorify him so one person is going to become a successful businessman and glorify god in that way another person will come into full time ministry and you know uh, equip people uh, and uh, so in that way they will glorify god so different people based on what he has written down in his book for us we will glorify him in different different ways but the ultimate purpose for all of us is that we have been created to glorify him Yeah, as long as you can grasp that, that's enough. We will not get into further detail uh, because there's no time. So, any last final questions? Uh, otherwise, we know we'll close. Yeah, let's just pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for all the things that we could um, learn today uh, regarding human kind, regarding why you created us, uh, regarding. the privileges which you have given us uh, because we are in your image thank you o lord for all of these uh, learnings that we could gain from your scripture we thank you lord that you have chosen uh, to give us a privilege which no other species have we are the only ones made in your image so o lord we think like you uh, we can plan the way you plan Uh, we are meant for eternity we are not just temporary and so we pray that we would use our eternal lives uh, for the right purposes so that in eternity we can enjoy the right rewards rather than wasting our lives over here and then regretting in eternity uh, that we um, failed uh, to live up to what you had planned so i pray o oh lord that you would enable us so that none of us will have regrets 
we will plan our lives understanding that we are not here for just temporary things like making money or getting married or just settling down we are meant for eternal things and that we will be there forever and ever and so oh lord help us to make wise decisions understanding the eternal nature of the spirit which you have given us thank you lord in jesus name amen, amen. thank you for your patience